post disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, so I'm not allowed to share my screen yet. One second. That should be it fixed. I do apologize. That is my fault. That's great. Um, yes, does this work? Great. Thank we you. Everything perfect. Great. Thank you for the kind presentation and thank you for inviting me for this uh, very exciting conference. I have been very, I have been looking very much forward to this. What I'm going to present today is that I will argue that sacred texts were a religious phenomenon in Old Norse religion and that sacred texts were used as a means by some Old Norse women to protect themselves and their communities in crisis. To my knowledge, no one has before identified any Old Norse texts as sacred before. This may be because that when we think about what is a sacred text, we think about texts that are comparable to the Bible, um, the Torah, the Quran, and that is texts that are written, they are dogmatic and they are canonical. And that's true that if we understand sacred texts as texts that, that are defined as written and dogmatic and canonical, then no, no such uh, text existed in Old Norse religion. Old Norse religion was oral and it was based on rituals and cultic practice and it was not at all preoccupied with dogmatics. So this understanding of sacred texts really relies on a quite narrow understanding of what qualifies as a text because it does not include oral texts. Um, and by this definition, no oral, oral re religion would ever have texts that could be considered sacred. So what I want to ask is that if we broaden our understanding of what can qualify as a text to something that is beyond the written text, did Old Norse religion then have a something that we could identify as sacred text? So I want to broaden uh, an understanding of text and to do this, I draw upon insights from the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. Ricoeur argues that uh, poems are texts that consist of dynamic entities that create unities of meaning. These compositions of text can be both oral and written. He argues that discourse is produced when a form is applied to some matter in order to shape it. And here he emphasizes that texts are not mere inscriptions of word, but are in fact shaped materiality. And this is consistent with the etymology of the word text because text derives from texture and texture means interweaving. So text is words woven together that rely on regulated laws of composition and this connotes materiality. Um, Ricoeur also argued that oral poetic expressions rely on processes equivalent to writing because the memorization of oral poems and oral narratives fixates the forms. So to emphasize that oral Old Norse poetry consisted of dynamic connected entities that shaped and wove meanings and that connoted materiality, I will from now on use the word texture to describe Old Norse poetry. And based upon Ricoeur's understanding of text, I will suggest that texture should be defined as the weavings of statements and weavings of statements can be both oral and written. I want to articulate the caveat that I am aware that, of course, it is impossible to access oral poetry that was performed a thousand years ago in the Viking Age uh, speech flea. Uh, so we don't have access to uh, these poems. Um, so what I will analyze is sources that consist of renderings of oral textures that have been fixated in medieval Icelandic manuscripts. And I also want to uh, articulate that I know that the approach to Old Norse sources and their 
pre-Christian credibility is something that divides scholarship. And it is probably something that scholarship will never agree upon. Um, and I don't want to go further into a discussion right now. Um, but as an historian of religion myself, I for now choose to view Old Norse poetry in the medieval manuscripts as what John Miles Foley articulated as textual shafts of a once living work of verbal art. Um, I have now established how I understand and identified Old Norse textures, and I will now turn to define sacredness in relation to Old Norse religion. And to do this, I combine the thoughts of Emil Durkheim and Rudolf Otto. Emil Durkheim uh, defined sacred as things set apart and forbidden. And the sacredness can, according to him, be space, time, text, humans, objects, and so forth. And these are, will all be set apart from the profane. So the sacred is also, it's always contrasted to what is profane. Rudolf Otto has coined the term numinous, which refers to the irrational aspect of religion, a unique state of mind that cannot strictly be defined. He describes the numinous as a non-rational feeling of das ganz andere, the holy other. He also argues that the sacred is a mysterium tremendum et fascinosum. So that is, the sacred is a mystery, a mystery that is both uh, terrifying and fascinating. So my understanding of sacredness in Old Norse religion is a combination of these insights from Joachim and Otto. So I just, uh, I understand sacredness as that which is set apart from the profane and shrouded with numinous power, which makes it both terrifying and fascinating. The historian of Old Norse religion, Jens Peter Schutt, uh, is inspired by Otto and um, uses the term numinous knowledge about trans-empirical knowledge that is gained during an initiation ritual and is secret to those who are not initiated. Numinous knowledge may, according to uh, Schutt, present itself as words like magic formulas or incantations, and it can be uh, objects with numinous qualities. So numinous knowledge is considered to be of and about the trans-empirical world, and it is only known by the special initiated individuals. So I will draw inspiration from should and understand old Norse sacred textures and textures that claim access to this trans-empirical numinous knowledge. By combining the insights uh, from Ricoeur and Joachim and Otto and Schutt, uh, I will propound this uh, working definition of Old Norse sacred textures. Old Norse sacred textures are Old Norse textual renderings of textures set apart and shrouded in numinous power, which makes them both terrifying and fascinating, mainly because they claim access to numinous knowledge. I want to analyze two accounts uh, from uh, of Old Norse literature, and I will start with an analysis of uh, the Thautur, Vilsa Thautur. is a uh, Thautur, a, a short story uh, within uh, Olaf's saga Helga, which is recorded in uh, the in Flat Air book. Um, the narrative in Vilsa Thautur unfolds in the year 1029 in Norway. And this is a time where gradually more people converted to Old Norse, to converted from Old Norse religion to Christianity. And this means that the old religion and its traditions and its values and worldview uh, were threatened uh, and in danger by Christianity. Rosa Thousa takes place uh, at a farm where they live a, a housewife and her husband. Uh, they have a son and a daughter, and then they have a male and a female thrall, two slaves. Um, the thousand begins with the horse uh, to the uh, farm dies, 
And then the housewife takes the penis of the horse and she embalms it in herbs and onions, and then she gives it the name Vulsi. Before dinner, every evening during autumn, the housewife holds Vulsi in her hands, uh, so it becomes erect and it can stand by itself. And then she composes a stanza over it. After she has composed her stanza, she passes Vulsi to her husband, and then he too has to hold Vulsi and compose a stanza. And as so, everyone in the household has to every evening uh, before dinner pass Vulsi along to every member and then compose a stanza. One evening, which is the one that is described in Vulsi Fauci, the Christian king Olaude and two of his men visit the household in disguise and they too uh, have to participate in the ritual. All in all, Rilsa Fauti contains 13 stanzas, all composed in Eric style, and many other stanzas have a very explicit sexual content. All stanzas have that in common that they all have the recurring verse, Thicki Mornia Theta Blöthi, may Mornia receive the sacrifice. And you can see the uh, first stanza of the poem uh, on my slide and my translations beside it. Um, as I said, it is it is composed in uh, Arabic style, and if we had a if it, it if it had if it had been a scaldic poem, uh, it would have very strict metric rules and very strict laws of composition. Um, this that then it, for example, in a Dotkvet poem, but this is Arabic style, so the laws of composition are not as as strict and, and regulated here. Um, but we still have uh, statements woven together, and they rely of they rely on some laws of composition, loose as as they may be. We have uh, alliteration, for example, in Linni and Leukum, and we have internal alliteration in Geiter and Stutter, and then there is the recurring verse Thikimonia Theta Blöti which weaves all the stanzas in the entire Rusa Thauta together into one coherent texture. So based on these characteristics, I will argue that this poem, the poem in Rusa Thauta, qualify as a texture. What, is, what I think is quite interesting about Rusa Thauta is that it is the housewife who is the ritual specialist, and she's the one who urges everyone in the household to participate in the ritual. The recurring verse, may Mornia receive the sacrifice, indicates that what we have here is a sacrificial ritual. Um, scholars do not agree on what is, what then is the sacrifice, what, what is sacrificed during this. And the most logical um, uh, proposal of what it could be is Vulsi, but Vulsi is not destroyed and it is not eaten as you would expect of a sacrifice, but some sacrifices do not necessarily require that the object is eaten. So I will just go forth and, and follow along that say that Vulsi is the uh, sacrificial object. Then who or what is Vulsi sacrificed to? And that is more clear, the monia. However, it is, quite unsure what the Mornia refers to. Um, Mornia can be understood in both a masculine singular form and in a feminine plural form. Olof Sundqvist argues that Mornia should be interpreted in the masculine singular form. And then Mornia means thought, uh, and the thought is the phallic symbol. Freya the fertility, Old Norse god Freya, uh, was perhaps related to a phallic cult. You can see on my slide a, um, a, a picture of a figurine which uh, scholars uh, interpret as uh, Freya, and he has a, a erected penis. Um, so if Freya was related to a phallic cult, uh, Sundqvist uh, suggests that Vulsi may be a representation of Freya, because Vulsi is a phallic, uh, a phallus. And um, so according to Sundqvist, the monia, meaning sword, being a representation of Freya, are the sacrificial recipients, the recipients of the sacrifice, 
And we'll see also a representation of Freya uh, the, is the sacrificial object, making Freya both the sacrificial object and the recipient of the sacrifice. And this is not an uncommon motive in Old Norse religion. We know from Hava Maul that when Odin hangs himself, he sacrifices himself to himself. So this could be an explanation. Hosteinsland and Kai Vogt argues that we in, instead should uh, interpret Monia in the feminine plural form, and then it should be translated to female Jotnar. Um, they agree with Sundqvist that Vulsi is a representation of Freya, and because Freya had Jotnar as his sexual partners, Steinstein and Vogt argues that what we have here is a Hiros Gamos, a sacred marriage between Freya embodied in Vulsi and female Jotnar in the Monier. No matter which interpretation we choose, um, it is very clear that Vilsi is a phallic symbol that is related to fertility and sex. And this corresponds with the semantic content of many of the stanzas we have in Vilsa Fauta, which also revolve around sex. It is also evident that Monia, either way, if they are Freya or female Jutner, they are deities who possess numinous power and the housewife can access this power when she holds Vilsi and performs her texture. The housewife uses the texture to invoke a numinous power that materializes in the erected horse penis in Vulsi, and then Vulsi becomes a sacred object. So the housewife establishes a line between her household and the trans-empirical world, a numinous sphere that is set apart from the profane and must have been both uh, terrifying and fascinating. And therefore, I will argue that the poem we have in Wilson Fauci qualifies as a sacred texture. The most active roles during the rituals are the housewife and the uh, female slave, uh, while the men uh, do not share the women's enthusiasm in the ritual. All the men reluctantly accept Vulsi and their stances make it very clear that they would rather leave this ritual to the women. So it seems that it is the women, it is the housewife who is in charge during dinner. The ritual also takes place in the private sphere and the private sphere, the home, was in Old Norse culture a domain dominated by women. Men had very limited power in the private sphere and Old Norse women knew this and we can see in in uh, several saga in a number of saga depictions that women consciously used dinner time where they had the power to implement and enforce actions that their male relatives did not want to engage in so the housewife uses her power in the private sphere to demand everyone in the household to participate in a ritual where they have to hold a horse penis and compose a stanza why does she do this, especially when the men very clearly feel uncomfortable during the ritual? As I said before, the story takes place during a time where Old Norse religion is gradually taken over by Christianity. So when the housewife insists on performing her Norse ritual every evening, she maintains a ritual that has roots in the old endangered religion. Um, Anna Sulgaard, another scholar, uh, have suggested that a horse phallus may have been used in a number of Norse rituals. So Vilsi may not only represent fertility, but also Old Norse religion and culture in its entirety. So by obliging her household to hold Vilsi in their hands and then pass Vilsi to the next member of the household every evening, the household, the housewife forces her household to remind themselves of the Old North heritage. The household have to hold Old North religion in their hands, and it is up to them to preserve Old North religion and maintain it to secure its survival in times of, of danger. She not only obliges her household to hold Wilsi, but the housewife also demands that everyone compose a sacred texture and dedicates a sacrifice to Old Norse deities. 
And this means that the members of the household must formulate and shape oral textures that uh, that protects and preserve Old Norse religion, and they have to listen to other repeatedly every evening, 10 times every evening, do the same. So by passing Rilsi to every member of the household before dinner and listening to every member composing a poem, the housewife establishes a line between every member of the household, connecting everyone present with each other. And this is very important at a time where Christianity threatens to tempt some of the members away from the household um, and the household's practices and belief. The daughter of the family is very sympathetic towards Christianity. She has figured out that the guest they have this particular evening is King Olav, a Christian king and his men, and she chooses not to disclose this information to her family members. And the men are dangerously passive during all this, they don't want to participate in uh, keeping Old Norse religion alive. So this means that the household is in fact at risk at being divided and the housewife feels obligated to take action. So by having everyone perform the same ritual every evening, she unites a family in an attempt to strengthen and preserve the coherence of the, <clears throat> of the household members. And at the same time, the sacred texture functions as a defense that protects the household from threats. The sacred texture creates a situation that is set apart and forbidden uh, at point by Durkheim. And this means that when, when performing the ritual, the household is forbidden to convert to Christianity. The sacred texture creates a sacred space that acts as a shield that protects uh, the family from Christianity. So the family cannot be converted to Christianity as long as this ritual is, is being repeated every evening. Then, and this is, Rilsa Thauter is a Thauter in uh, Olaf Saga Helga. So uh, it doesn't uh, go this way every evening. This particular evening, King Olaf is the last person to hold Rilsi and perform a stanza. The first part of his stanza is about sailing, and then he too, like everybody else, dedicates Rilsi to the Monia. And lastly, he utters, and you, dog of the house, you take care of this monster. And then he takes Rilsi and throws it to the dog, and the dog swallows Rilsi. So the sacred objects that connected the family members to each other and kept a coherence in the household and the sacred objects, along with the sacred texture, the function as a shield against Christianity disappears. Of course, the housewife becomes very upset and uh, she composes a stanza saying, lift me over door hinges and onto door beams to see if I can retrieve the sacred sacrifice. The word sti is a translation of the Old Norse vita, which is sometimes is related to divination. So in this texture, the housewife claims to have access to numinous knowledge. She's, uh, she asked to be lifted above, and then she gets access to numinous knowledge that can let her know whether Rilsi can be saved or not. Um, however, Rilsi cannot be retrieved. The damage has already been done, and the numinous power and the defense that were created from the speech acts uh, of the sacred texture and the and that were materialized in the horse penis all disappear along with Rilsi. This means that the defense they had against Christianity is now gone and their household is exposed to conversion. King Olav uh, seizes this opportunity and then he converts the household to Christianity and thus ends Rilsa uh, It ends happily for King Olav and for Christianity. Stanislav and Vox um, reflects upon in their article whether the housewife can be characterized as a vulva. They argue that vulvaed were uh, old Norse uh, prophetesses that uh, knew of theater magic and divination. And Stanislav and Vox argues that the housewife in Vilsa Thauder, she performs divination and also that the words uh, vulsi and vulva are related to the word uh, vulro meaning staff and staff 
uh, staffs were tools used by uh, Völler in Old Norse religion. Um, but they also uh, make the counter arguments that the sources describe uh, Völler as isolated from their family homesteads and they have a nomadic way of life. And also that Völler uh, seems to be connected to the otherworldly sphere, sphere in general and not specific beings. And what we have in Rosa Thauter is a woman who is very much connected to her household and is connected to specific otherworldly beings, the Monia. So Steinstein and Vox, Vox uh, acknowledge that the housewife does not fit the tap, uh, typological traits of a vulva, but she does have features that evoke associations to the vulva. Um, so whether or not she is a vulva, she uses sacred textures as a means to gain access to numinous knowledge. And I will argue that this was a technique also known and used by at least some vulva. Uh, the last account I will analyze uh, just shortly is uh, from Erik Sagarøyda, chapter four. Uh, this is an account uh, of a, a vulva who I will argue also used a sacred texture. The, uh, this account takes place in a old North settlement in Greenland where there have been a shortage of food and therefore they have paid a vulva for Björk Little Vilva to uh, practice Seder and find out when there will be food again. Thor Björk prepares to perform a Seder ritual and ask if any woman present knows the chants required for, for the ritual. And these chants are called Vat Lukur. Vat can translate to ward and Lukur to lure. Um, and so Vat Lukur could have been chants that should allure spirits to the ritual. There's a Christian woman present, uh, Gudrida, who admits that she was taught the chants as a child, and after some persuasion, she agrees to sing the Vat Lukur. Then Thorberg places herself in a high seat, and this that she places herself uh, high up uh, evokes associations to the door frame we saw in Wilsterthauter. It seems that divination works best when the pra practitioner is lifted and has an overview of both the imminent and the trans-empirical world. Then the other women on in the settlement form a ring around the vulva and Gudrida begins to speak the vast Lukur. She does so very beautifully and many spirits uh, comes to the vulva and the Seder ritual is successful, and Thorbjörg can reveal that the times of hardship will soon end. Unfortunately, we do not have any accounts of what is sung or said during the Vathlukur, so an analysis of the texture in itself cannot be done. Um, but it is very clear that it is the chant that is used as, uh, that this chant is used as one of the vulva's very important means to gain numinous knowledge. Thorberg reveals that the spirits at first refused to do her biddings, but when Gudilva sang the Vathlukur very beautiful, all the, a lot of spirits came to Thorberg and uh, revealed the numinous knowledge to her. Um, and this shrouded the ritual with numinosity. Uh, yes. Even though the information about the Vatlukur is scarce, the saga tells us that Gudrida kvath the chant, and kvath is a verb that is used in all Old Norse literature when anyone is going to perform a poem. Kvath means spoke, utters. So this suggests that Vatlukur were not just melodic sounds that formed uh, that, that formed a song, but it was actually spoken weavings of words that formed a texture. And based on this, I will argue that Vathlo could qualify as a sacred texture. It is also emphasized in Erik Sagarøyda that the practice of Seder relies on women's agency. It is a woman, the vulva, who sits on a high seat and sees into the future. And for the ritual to work, the person who sings the Vathlo could must be a woman. And before the Vard Lukur song, all other women have to gather in a circle around the vulva, 
creating a protecting ring around her. And this ring of women may have both protected the vulva from outside interruptions, but also protected the community from spirits who, who were allured into the, the circle, into the vulva. We know from Inglinga Saga chapter seven that Seder is tied to femininity. And it seems in Eric Sagarreda that the ritual requires the presence of many women. So the women's participation in the ritual strengthens the vulva's abilities and, the, and also the effect of the ritual. This benefits the whole settlement because the access to food will come back and their survival is secured. I will now uh, sum up. Motivated by my wish to examine if sacred textures were a religious phenomenon in old world religion, I have propounded a definition that perhaps can capture Old Norse sacred text. I defined Old Norse sacred textures as textual renderings of textures set apart and shrouded in luminous power, which makes them both terrifying and fascinating because they claim access to luminous knowledge. I analyzed two accounts of Old Norse women using sacred textures in a crisis situation. In Rusa Thauter, the sacred texture acts as a shield to fend off Christianity, to protect Old Norse religion and its community from Christianity. And this works uh, successfully until the uh, sacred object that supported the sacred texture is destroyed. And in the second account, I analyzed a vulva who performed a ritual of Seder in a crisis where an Old Norse settlement lacks food. And by using a sacred texture and by the participation of uh, women, uh, the vulva gets the knowledge that she needed and food will bring, will come back to the settlement. So based on these analysis, I find that some Old Norse women produced and performed sacred textures al hoc and in situations of crisis as a means to ward off threats and protect Old Norse community. And I also argue that the production of sacred textures was a technique among others that Old Norse women could use to gain access to numinous knowledge. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Um, you can see my Twitter handle here too. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was 